There are 10 myths. I mean, just 10 big myths that I need to blow up here so we don't wind up with unrealistic expectations. And I'm going to tell you why this is so important, and then I'm going to go through five of them, then I'm going to do the other five next week. Let me tell you why I'm talking about myths. I love busting myths, by the way. But I'm talking about it because it's not what happens in life that upsets us. It's whether or not our expectations are violated, okay? If you get married and you have this Hollywood, fanciful, sitcom view of what marriage is, and then what you get is just an average, typical marriage, you can feel like, oh my God, I've made a horrible mistake because there's no soundtrack that kicks in. There's no laugh track that kicks in. Everything doesn't get resolved in 30 minutes. And you go, oh my God, we must be horrible people. If you're in the infatuation phase and you said, oh, we're so in love, all we need is each other. That's not true. You also need rent money. You got to pay the utilities. You got to both have jobs. You've got to figure out a division of labor. You got to figure out what you're going to do when his mother comes over, when her mother comes over. I mean, it's completely different than the infatuation phase. So if you go into it just thinking we're going to always be in love, it starts out like, oh my God, we know each other so well. We finish each other's sentences. And six months later, it's Yeah, quit interrupting me. I mean, it's completely different. Everything changes across time. So if your expectations are violated, then you're going to cry foul. When in fact, what you may have is fine. You just didn't expect the right thing. So I want to blow up some of the myths that people expect. Because if you don't expect wrong things, then you won't be so upset. And let me tell you, throw logic out the window because we're talking about relationships. When you talk about relationships, you're talking about emotions. And when you're talking about emotions, logic has no place. Emotion takes the place of logic. Myth number one, I love this one. A great relationship depends on a great meeting of the minds. Doesn't that sound lofty? A great relationship depends on a great meeting of the minds. It just feels like, you know, we've got to be birds of a feather, that they should be more alike than different. The problem is it's a complete crock. You're not ever going to see things through your partner's eyes. And if you ever have to stop being 100% of who you are to be half of a couple, the price is too high. If you have to stop being you, To be half of us, you made a bad trade. It's not going to be a meeting of the minds. You're going to see things differently. Men are going to be men. Women are going to be women. And that's okay. And therapists that try to change that need therapy because that's not the way it works since the Industrial Revolution. No question about it. Most men can do jobs that used to be stereotypically women. Women can do jobs that used to be stereotypically men. I totally get that. But emotionally, we're wired up differently. And here's the good news. I don't want a wife that thinks and feels like I do. Because trust me, I do not want to be married to me. Under no theory, under no circumstances, do I want to be married to me. God help me if I was married to me. Somebody that thought like I did problem solved like I did, reacted like I did, that would be the most boring thing I can imagine. I'm married to someone that is very different, very, very different. And that's a good thing. It's complementary. The things that aren't natural for me are natural for her. The things that are natural for her are natural for me. And so that works out. You don't have to have a great meeting of the minds. It's not better or worse. Men aren't better because they're one way or another. Women aren't better because they're one way or another. But there are individual differences. You don't have to have a great meeting of the minds. And because you and your partner don't see everything exactly the same way, that's okay. In fact, it's a good thing. Like I said, I do not want to be married to me. Myth number two, a great relationship demands a great romance. Well, that's not true. Look, these things happen in phases. Think about it. When you were first together, that's the infatuation phase. There's a big difference between falling in love and being in love. 
And it's not that one's better than the other. They're different. Falling in love is fun, right? You stay up till three o'clock in the morning and you're talking on the phone for hours and everything is fresh and new and you're infatuated and you get butterflies every time he or she walks in the room. That's the infatuation phase, the falling in love phase, the honeymoon phase. But that just can't last forever. It doesn't last forever. What happens is you transition to a more comfortable love where you're at ease with each other. And one's not better than the other. Trust me, I've been married 43 years. We've been together for 47 years. And we're very much in love. It's not that we're not in love. We're not falling in love. We fell in love almost 50 years ago. But we're still in love 50 years later. But it's very different. We're very comfortable with each other. We love spending time together. We find each other interesting and fascinating in different ways. She's multi-sided and has different interests, and that's what makes her so interesting. But there's a big difference. So if you think the sizzle's gone out of the skillet, well, maybe that's true, but what's it been replaced with? There might have been sizzle in the skillet, but now there's a warm bun in the oven. And I don't mean that in the pregnancy sort of way. I mean, it's just a different kind of warmth and connection and depth of emotion that is shared between two people in a relationship. So there are phases, and one's not better than another. They're just different. You may not want to stay up all night talking to your partner now, which you did 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Now you might get the same pleasure out of keeping each other's feet warm and getting a good night's sleep with your backs up against each other. That can be very rewarding. It can be very comforting. It can be very nurturing. And the number one need among all people is acceptance, belongingness, and feeling that from your partner in a safe, secure, predictable way is meeting man's number one need. What could be more rich than that? So if you define great romance as infatuation and falling in love, no, you don't have to have that. And if it's not in your relationship, focus on what is in your relationship, that you can count on your partner, that that relationship is predictable, that it's dependable. Doesn't mean that you can't surprise each other. Doesn't mean that you can't still have some mystery and think of and find ways to keep things interesting. Of course you can. But Robin and I have been married for 43 years, and we have never spoken the D word in our home. Not ever. So you say a little mystery is good? Not about that. We made a decision a long time ago that if we have a disagreement, the relationship is not on the table. That is not the stakes for which we play. So we both know no matter what happens in this discussion, no matter how mad I get or how upset I get or how upset she gets, when it's all over with, we're going to still be there for each other. That's just not the stakes for which we play. Not now, not ever. And knowing that is very important. So there's a lot of richness that comes from being in love as opposed to falling in love. Myth number three, a great relationship requires great problem solving. Hardy, har, 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 har. I have talked to so many marital therapists, of which I was the worst I've ever met, by the way. That may make you want to hit the stop button and go do something else. I just didn't have the patience for it. But I've talked to so many marital therapists that say, what do you focus on? Well, we, we teach them how to recognize and solve problems. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> How's that working for you? <sighs> no, you don't. You want to know why the same issues keep coming up generation after generation after generation after generation? Because they never get solved. How many generations do you think it goes back where one part of the couple, either the husband or the wife, thought the other was too harsh with the kids, and their partner thought their partner was too easy with the kids. There was the hard disciplinarian, and then there was the soft place to fall. 
How many generations think it goes back where kids thought divide and conquer? They knew which one to go to. They knew where to go to get a yes. They knew where to go to get by with something easy. Why do you think that has persisted back to the 1600s, the 1700s, the 1800s? I mean, why? Because it's never been solved. We don't solve these problems. Why do people have conflict about sex? Because we don't all have the same sex drive at the same time. We don't know how to deal with that. Why are mother-in-laws a punchline? Because she is the other woman in the husband's life. She knows him better than you do. She knows what he likes better than you do. She knows how to make macaroni and cheese exactly the way he likes it. She's the other woman in his life. And maybe she doesn't respect boundaries. Do you think you invented that? You did not. That was going on in the 1600s when they saw her coming up the trail on her donkey. Oh, what are we going to do? Well, it's too late to run. She can see the smoke coming out of the chimney. She knows we're here. That was going on then. It's going on now. Because we don't solve certain problems. They're just inherent to the nature of merging two lives together. And that's okay. What you have to do is just agree to disagree. You just have to say, you know what? I'm going to give you this one because you gave me that one last month. I'm just going to roll with you on this one. You just have to learn to bend but not break. You just have to learn to say, hey, I have to pick my battles, and this is one that can't be won, so I'm not going to pick this battle. Now, here's my favorite. A great relationship requires common interests that bond you together forever. This one's so good, I have to say it twice. A great relationship requires common interests that bond you together. I belong to a club where we play golf. And I see a guy that comes out there every week with his wife to play golf. She is miserable. I guarantee she is miserable. She so does not want to be there. But I promise you, somebody has told them, you have to share common interest. You have to get interested in what the other person is interested in to have a great relationship. So she's decided, I've got to go play golf with him. I've seen women that are getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning, sitting in a duck blind with her husband freezing to death. And I've talked to them 10 times and said, well, did you have a good time this morning? Oh, my God, I'd rather get a root canal. Why are you here? Well, he loves it, and, you know, I, I want to be interested in what he's interested in. No, you don't. Let me tell you. I sleep with my wife. I eat with my wife. I watch television with my wife. I travel with my wife. Now I got to go play tennis with her too? She doesn't want to do what I do. I guarantee you she wants a break from me. She has interests that I don't have. Like I said, I've been married 43 years. I promise you some of those have got to feel like dog years to her. And I play tennis every day for two, three hours. I am absolutely certain she treasures that time. Oh my God, he's gone. People have asked me, are you going to retire? Robin answers always, no, he's not, (laughs) because she doesn't want me here underfoot all the time. We don't have a lot of common interest other than living together, eating together, having kids together, living in the same house together. We travel together. We do everything together. Now I've got to go do these things that she's interested in, or she's got to go do the hobbies that I have. She doesn't want to go to the golf course with me. She doesn't want to go down and watch me play tennis. We played tennis together in a doubles tournament one time. It did not work out. We totally looked at it differently. She looked at it as camaraderie. I looked at it as competition. We just looked at it differently. You don't have to share common interest with your spouse. If they go off and do things on their own, great. Support them in doing that. Encourage them to do that. But you don't have to do everything with your spouse. We love our time together, and that's probably due in part because we have time apart. Think about it. You love ice cream? What if you had it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week for a year? My first job was at a pizza place. I worked there for a good while. 
And then I got fired because I kept forgetting to put the drinks on the ticket, and that apparently was a really high profit item. And so they, after telling me about ten times, they said, "All right, uh, sorry, you're you're out of here." So I got fired, but I was thirteen, and Leiden said I was sixteen. So I guess my brain wasn't quite ready to put the drinks on the ticket. But after working at that pizza place, I couldn't eat pizza for like five years. Because as soon as I smelled it, it was like, oh, my God. I was so saturated with the spices and ingredients and everything of pizza, I couldn't eat it again for five years. And then all of a sudden, it was okay. I just started eating it again. But I was so overwhelmed with it that I just lost my appetite for it. I don't want that to ever happen in a relationship. You need breaks. You need time alone to go do something. Go do something with your friends. Go do something in your workshop, go spend time in the garden or at the library or doing whatever you want to do, whatever your interests are, you need some time alone. I promise you, you need some time apart from your partner. Myth number five, and then we'll be done. And this one is just such a ridiculous myth that I'll be very quick. A great relationship is a peaceful one. I list that as a myth, but I don't really know it's true because I don't think it's ever happened. There is no relationship that is entirely peaceful. People ask Robert and I, do you guys have big arguments? The answer is no. We don't have big arguments because we don't let them get big. We deal with things as they come up. We don't let it build up for 30 days and then go nuclear. We deal with it at the time before it turns into a forest fire. But there are no peaceful relationships. You're merging two lives, two individuals. They're different, and so they're going to get in each other's way. You're going to see things differently, and you're going to have conflict. And some of it you'll never resolve. And if your expectation is, I'll never resolve this, I'll just live with it, well, then that's okay. If you don't have the expectation that it's going to be a success-only journey, then you won't freak out when it's not. So recognize there are going to be rough patches. You're going to have some disagreements. Later on, I'm going to talk to you about how to fight fair. When I say fight, I mean argue. I mean disagree. I don't mean physically fight because that's a drop-dead deal breaker. So those are five of the 10 myths that I want you to get clear in your mind. 